Hi, I'm Jeff Forster. I'm the lead pastor at Heritage Church in Sterling Heights, Michigan. And uh, I was invited today to talk about developing a multicultural uh, identity or a multicultural ministry uh, through your church and in your church. And so I just wanted to share a couple of quick ideas that have been effective for us over the years. When we launched, we launched in a high school in a community that was about 98, almost 99% white, mostly um, Polish and Italian German immigrants. And uh, when we moved, when we finally bought our building, we moved to an area that uh, was down in the 80s, 80% uh, or so uh, white. And so as we made that move, we had the conversation with our elders about the fact that the neighborhood, the community began, uh, was different and had a different makeup. And so uh, how were we going to embrace that? And uh, were we ready for uh, the new look that Heritage Church was going to have? And uh, my elders and the rest of my team were very enthusiastic about that. We embraced the idea. Being in the Detroit, Michigan region, I don't think it's a secret that there's a tremendous amount of uh, brokenness on a racial level um, in our community. And so we wanted that to be a part of our uh, conversation, a part of the hallmark of our church, um, but we weren't entirely sure how to go about that. And so we decided a couple of key things at the beginning that might be useful to you. I put them on the board here, and I don't know if you can read them, but uh, the first one is just know who you are. Because uh, as a church leader, you're going to draw who you are. And so for me, I'm a country kid from uh, the farm land in northern Michigan up in the Thumb area, and uh, certainly not a very diverse community where, where I grew up. And so I had to know who I was, because who you are is usually who you're going to attract. But my heart was for all the people in my community. And so I wanted to make sure that uh, I was building systems that allowed us to reach people that were different from me, but I had to know, first of all, my own heart. Significant in my heart was the idea that all people matter, and so uh, that was at the core of our decision-making. So know who you are, and then know your community. We did a lot of work on, uh, with demographics, and I know you probably know all about those things too, uh, but we did a lot of work trying to figure out what is the makeup of our community, uh, the socioeconomic makeup, the racial uh, makeup. We, we also wanted to find out you know, uh, the married versus unmarried single parents and all those kinds of things. And that helped us get kind of a profile on the community that we believed God was calling us to and uh, understanding clearly what that target was, what it looked like, helped us begin to build systems to be the most effective we could be in reaching that community. And so knowing who we were and then knowing who our community was and then knowing my leadership it was incredibly important before I got out and decided to, you know, just turn the apple cart over and demand that we become a multicultural church. Uh, I needed to know that my leadership was with me, that they also knew that we were called to go down this path, that they uh, were all in because there was a lot of risk. If you just decide that you're going to jump in and force multicultural uh, ministry, sometimes uh, the new believers or the non-believers in your community aren't ready for you to begin that process. Sometimes even your long timers have a hard time embracing that. And so you need to know that your leadership is in and that uh, you're ready. Because if you push too hard too soon and you don't have uh, your rest of your leaders around you, there will be blood and it might be yours. And so uh, I really encourage you, make sure that your leadership is on board. And then leverage the people that you have in your church. What we began to do as we were moving into an area that had a, uh, a, a more diverse population, we began to be aware of what leaders did we already have in the ministry that were um, uh, uh, ethnically more diverse than you know, the majority. And so we began to realize, I, I had a lady from Trinidad and Tobago that uh, was on our coffee team, and she was one of our best greeters. So we wanted to make sure that we leveraged her out front. I had the conversation with her. Hey, listen, uh, we want to uh, invite more people just like you. Would you help us? And she said yes. When we were getting ready to do some TV commercials and some print materials uh, that we were getting ready to do in the area, we had one African-American guy in the church. And so I went to him. I said, we're getting ready to do some marketing, some advertising. We're moving into an area that has a lot more African-American people in our community. Um, and I want you to be in our marketing. Would you do that? And that's an awkward conversation to have. But when you come with humility and with an understanding that you need to be taught, you don't know everything, and uh, a desire to reach people um, just like them, uh, he embraced it very quickly. He said, yes, I'm all in. And uh, he made a lot of jokes about it, but uh, it, it had an impact. We also leveraged, I have a, a, an Indian gentleman that's a part of our church that is one of our elders. We made sure that he uh, began to take more prominent roles in leading small groups and other things because we wanted this uh, uh, image 
of the fact that all people are welcome in our community. I never got up and made an announcement. We are a multicultural church. Never got up and made an announcement. We're going to be more open armed, uh, have more open arms to uh, other cultures. We just began to model it from the stage. We began to model it in the lobby. We began to model it um, behind the scenes. So there was never any dramatic announcement. It's just something we began to model. And that was because our people were willing to uh, leverage their uh, ethnic background in order to reach more people like them. And then um, pray, 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 pray. We uh, run a food pantry that feeds about 150 families every week. And a number of years ago, um, we began to realize that most of the people that were coming were from an Arabic descent that speak only Arabic, many of them, and almost no English. And so we would feed them, but we didn't have any way to share the gospel with them. And so we began to pray. And I had the elders in the church praying and several of the leaders praying that God would send us an evangelist that could share the gospel uh, in Arabic to these very fine families. And, and we, we were concerned about them. We wanted to feed their bodies, but we wanted to feed their souls even more. And so we began to pray and uh, God send us somebody. And sure enough, the Lord just opened the door and he sent us a young Egyptian pastor that had had to leave uh, his country because of some persecution issues. And uh, he landed in our community and was a church planter, was uh, a, a tremendous evangelist. As a matter of fact, a pretty famous guy in the Arabic world. And uh, we prayed and prayed and prayed that God would send us an effective evangelist. And God sent us one of the best uh, young Arabic evangelists we can imagine. Later on, we wound up launching two campuses that are Arabic only. They speak only Arabic uh, in their services. Uh, we have about a million Arabic speaking people in our region. And so this was something that we decided to do. That one, because of the cultural dynamics and a lot of the things going on in the news and that, uh, we knew that would cost us. And so again, uh, knowing who I was, I'm all in on this, on this multicultural thing, and knowing our community, there's a million Arabic-speaking people, and then knowing our leadership, we sat down again with the leaders and said, I think God's calling us to plant a couple of these campuses for Arabic-speaking people, but it may or may not be well-received in the community. Are you guys in? And they said, we're all in. So in that early season, there was a lot of misunderstanding. People couldn't imagine what it was we were doing. Some people thought we were starting mosques or whatever, and it wasn't. We were starting new churches to share the gospel with people who could only speak Arabic. And so uh, our people were patient. We provide a lot of education to our leaders to be able to communicate well. And since then, God's blessed. We've seen hundreds of people find faith in Jesus uh, as a result of that just a few years ago. So we prayed and prayed. And then I would say this, don't force it. If uh, when, when we were in our community that was almost 99% white, there was no ability, quite honestly, to build much of a multicultural uh, identity in our community or in our church because it didn't exist in the community. Uh, some people think, well, then what we should do is import that. And in my experience, it comes off a little bit disingenuous and it certainly comes off sometimes as being something that's forced rather than natural. So don't force it. If God's put you in a place that doesn't have that, then have a heart for multicultural ministry. Partner with multicultural ministries in other areas. Partner on a global level. Partner in, in cities throughout our country. Um, but don't feel like you have to force it in your own culture. So know who you are. Know your community. Know your leadership. Leverage the people that God's already put in place. And don't force it. Hope that helps. This has been a Whiteboard Leadership Moment. To get more information, go to converge.org.